The Floating World and the Legend of the Five Bamboo Fly Rods by Gabe Batson. Chapter 9 Eighth Veil And so the night has turned into another day, but my love remains. Fine silk handkerchief touched with perfume that masked the heavy textured air of smoke pouring from the saloon. He hates himself for leaving her, but hates her more for leaving him. Wrath cuts clean to the bone, fang-like, with precision, like the black moccasin that chases its prey. Raging flames glowed in the street of mud and manure. Daddy boy was severe, quick, sharp, and certain. He strode straight-legged into the saloon through the flames and re-emerged through a wall of orange, violet, and white heat, clutching a rifle. From his coat pocket, he pulled a box of shells and sleeved them into the receiver. They could have gotten away with me just killing one, but now I'll kill all three. He cycled the chamber and strode straight leg towards the bonga. A figure in white linen holding a Winchester through a crowd of people who knew not whether to run or stare. He rose the walnut stock to his shoulder and shot across the rear deck of the boat. The speed of the bullet flitted past the ears of Fen, Anju, and Durak. Daddy boy cycled the action again, ejecting the hot brass. Fourteen more to go. You have something that belongs to me! He roared as he let fly another round past the terrified trio. They crouched, huddled within the guiding arms of Fen, making their way to the far side of the boat. Don't worry, y'all. I'll find you, yelled Daddy Boy. The miasma, smoking from the open chamber, cloaked his face as he cycled the 13th round. Panic swept through the port as celebrants stampeded away from the madman with the gun. He looked to the back of the boat as his brow furied and his eyes glowered. Icy with hate, he ran up the ramp. A few people were milling about on the deck as he pushed through them, fighting towards the back of the boat. Are you both all right? Asked Fen. Anju and Durok were both all right, so Fen clomb back over the railing. His legs spanned the gap between the deck and the paddle wheel. He motioned for Durok to hand him the cases, who passed them one by one. Fen balanced them on the trusses. Then brave Durok picked up Anju and passed her through. All three perched on the wheel hub. The main bearing was oozing grease into the river. Daddy boy swung the Winchester. He felt like the king of thirsty Natchez. He sniffed about. He could smell blood. He yelled, Prepare for a sweet rendezvous! He let go another shot. He rushed over to the river and looked out to see if he could see anyone swimming away in the moonlight. Anju trembled. She hid her eyes behind her arm in the shadow of the paddle wheel. Do not fear, my dear, she thought. This river is not the end. She lost her breath for a moment. Everything was stunned into silence. Climb out! Anju said aloud to her friends. Fen looked into her eyes and nodded. He backed through the wheel to the other side of the boat. Durak and Anju passed the cases through and started to climb out too. Daddy boy ran back and tornadoed. He saw Fen and Anju climbing out on the other side of the boat. He cracked a shot which sailed through. Ten bullets left. He shot again. The bullet hit the side of a column, shooting splinters at Fen. Daddy boy shot again. The lead buried itself in the deck near where Anju stepped out. We have no other choice but to try, said Fen to Anju. Yes, said Anju. Then we shall, said Durak. And so they three, Swift Fen, Little Anju, and Brave Durak, slipped into the river. Daddy Boy ran to the railing and looked for another round. They were gone. 
Anju was curled on the meadow floor, something nuzzled her awake. A loud exhale of hot breath moistened her neck. A bird whistled and wind blew through the forest. The air smelled as sweet as black locust. Sunlight warmed the field of hay. She again heard the sniffing of a large beast. You have power, she heard a young woman's voice say. Anju opened her eyes. A stallion nosed the ground. Its dark hind was bruised with the cluster of white stars. Anju looked to the rider with ringlets of auburn hair over bronze shoulders, strong and toned muscles. She wore a camisole, matter and color. Claudia? asked Anju. We've been waiting ages for you, said Claudia as she pulled the reins and galloped away. Anju looked after her. Durak's smiling face moved into her eyesight. His cheeks were ruddy and full, his eyes sparkled. She also saw Fen leaning into the breeze. They both looked whole and brand new in the brightness of the day. She walked bare feet to the edge of the meadow. The raging waters bloomed. Smoke rose from the cliff. Where do we go from here? Asked Fen. His voice reverberated through the air. Anju looked at him. He faded in the wind. Her feet began to lift. Frustration teared down her face. Stay! Stay! She yelled and grimaced. She willed her feet back to the ground. Don't slip away, child. Not again, said Durak, as he put his arm over her shoulder. I remember now, thought Anju. It's been too long. I almost forgotten. Fen crouched in the tall grass and large tears streamed down his face. The bright mountains ringed the valley. The earth smelled like clay, warm to the touch. The grass bristled in the breeze. Four horses galloped across the plain. Child, awaken, said a man's voice. Anju's eyes opened in a four-post bed illuminated by soft and fine curtains blowing on the canopy. Her dark hair over the pillow. Pilan put his hand upon her head. It took you a while, he said, so wild and free. Fen and Durak? She asked. Yes, they're here, said Pilan. They told us of the times you've had, quite an adventure. Anju said not a word. I called out to you one night. I saw you by the falls, but you jumped back before I could reach you. The rods are here? Yes, they're safe. Anju rose and walked across the room towards the morning in the open doorway. She drifted past the arches and down the warm colored steps and looked over the ledge. In the distance was a valley where long tubes of swirling light danced in tangles. So many lives. Where does it all begin and end? She asked. It all already has, Pilon said. I forgot to come back home. It'll be easier from now on. His gray eyes caught the sunlight. Why is everything like this? We move through space and time until our worlds collide, he said. Each of us contained in our own lives, full of possibilities. Your life remains unchanged, for your path varies little. That's why you return here. Because this is where the many worlds join. Do I have to go back? Can I just stay with you? Of course you can stay. But after a while, you'll want to return. Why? She asked. To search, he said, for somebody to love. Anju said not a word. And so ended the legend of the five bamboo fly rods. Everybody in the room laughed and looked at Anju and Elba sitting on the couch. The long flames leapt in the fireplace. Music dappled through the room. Elba's eyes widened. He turned to Anju. Why didn't you tell me? He asked. Would you believe me if I did? Said Anju. Is this reality? He asked. All of it is, as far as we know. Said Anju. Our Our lives... lives spread across an infinite number of universes. 
thought John. I can't even begin to comprehend. I don't even know how we got here, said Elvis. We skipped across the edge, said Anju. Beyond the reach of the most powerful telescopes, beyond a horizon where time and space are flipped and light outruns itself, said John. This is like a dream, said Danny. You're not too far from the truth, said Nita. It's important to remember when it's so easy to get twisted. Is that what the rods are for? asked Jeremy. Yes, they help us remember, said Claudia. She clasped her hands over Jeremy's shoulder and rested her chin. Our task is to learn what the ancients knew, said Pilon, to contemplate the power of the five rods and to create other objects like them to create things of beauty and spread them throughout the world. Is that what you brought us here to do? Make things? Asked Mazzy. To create things that take on a life of their own. Their presence in the world will bring more people back, said Pilon. Is that what you aim to do? Bring more people in? Asked Elvis. Yes, more and more people. The light is fading, and we need help restoring the spark of life for the love of humanity. That's why we brought you here, just as I was once brought here. We are with you. When we go back to the regular world, will we forget what we learned here? Asked Elvis. I believe that's what's happening to me, said Kayleen. I'm having trouble remembering when I'm in the other world. I still get lost and it takes me time to readjust when I return. It's important to remember slowly, or it could overwhelm you, said John. You'll get better with practice. When I was young, I had all of it racing through my mind. The floating world and all the other worlds combined. It overwhelmed me. It was more than I could bear. John, you're more sensitive than many of the others. It was my fault for not properly preparing you. Eventually, you learn to control your power. Now, I believe we're all stronger for it. We learn from every turn. Anju stood up and walked over to John and touched him on the arm. She thought of Durak and Fen and how gallant they were. They tried to help John. It seemed everybody did, but nobody could reach him. You needed to figure things out for yourself, she thought as she looked into his eyes. I didn't think I was worth caring for. It pained him to think it, but that was a long time ago. It's now become part of his wonderful story. He looked over to Kayleen. Do you need anything, Kayleen? He asked. I'm thirsty. Perhaps we should get a drink, she said. Wait a second, said Mazzy. Who was the guy who kidnapped me? What? said Elvis. Who kidnapped you? That's what I want to know, said Mazzy. Pilon laughed. (laughs) Ah, the little round man. He is an agent of the floating world, though admittedly he sometimes has a little too much fun. Yes, he can get a bit creative with his methods, but he's very effective. (laughs) Some things never change, said Nita. There's so much to learn and so much to do. I I cherish these moments. I'm so glad we're here together. This is just the beginning. Now let's have some dinner. The next day, Pilon looked out to the mountains. The sliding doors were open, and the hot, dry air smelled of sagebrush. The palace in the form of a world, he thought. All of those kids here for the first time... They all have their stories to tell. I remember it took me a while to find mine. There was something Nita said a long time ago. Look deep deep within within your your heart. heart. That's That's where where you'll you'll find me. He thought of the beginning. A large wooden door was open in a stucco building at the end of Main Street in Twin Piney, Wyoming. Young Pilon sat at the bar sipping 25 cent high life. The room was carved wooden columns and arches painted white long ago. The climate was dry. Things remained perfectly preserved. Paint didn't flake. It just got thinner. 
He selected a song on the jukebox. Evening sunlight blared through the dust behind the windows. The bartender had been watching him for a couple of days. When she heard him play a song called Changes, her heart beat a little faster. He doesn't look old enough to be in here, she thought. Doesn't bother me none. He's probably thirsty. He didn't seem to be from around there, but she knew enough farm boys to know a hard worker when she saw one. He too wondered about her. She looked only a couple of years older, but they were still at an age where that mattered. Her long hair hung down to her bony biceps in a style that was a decade too late. Her pale skin betrayed she stayed up nights, like an owl, perhaps laughing with her friends on a couch brought home from a thrift store. She came over and leaned her frame over the bar. The sunlight caught her hazel eyes. They looked lighted from within. He could feel the air in the place change and noticed a dust-free streak where someone wiped the mirror behind the bottles. She asked, so he told her he'd been on the road a while, hitching from state to state, looking for work. He helped a guy with a busted truck in Ohio, timing Jane. He stayed in an abandoned building in Chicago. He then went west, Nebraska, Wyoming. I'm from Kansas. We had cattle and horses, he said. Must have been hard work, she said. It wasn't too bad. Uh, I'm an only child, but my father had a few hands. (laughs) He laughed and said, Once we made a small wrestling ring in the barn, all of the men twisted each other up. They pinned me down, so it made it impossible to move. One morning after my 18th birthday, my father came into my room and told me he wanted me out. I knew this day would come. Go find a job. There's nothing for you here, he said. Don't call. Don't write. It'll only upset your mother. So I stuffed some clothes into an army knapsack and sneaked out the back door. I didn't say goodbye. And chances were, no one was chasing after me. The bartender felt for him, but she'd heard this kind of story before. Ultimately, she knew the meaning of the song. The next morning he stood in the high desert. He wore dungarees, a jean jacket, and an old pair of boots. The sack he carried contained a sleeping bag. He found it in the basement of a church. Strong winds kicked up with sunrise, blustering with August heat. The valley was lined with saw-toothed mountains separating him from the res on the other side of the pass. flat bottom clouds hovered in a single plane. They spanned the sky. The long and narrow highway connected the town straight to the horizon. He could see ten miles on, but there wasn't a car in sight. Hadn't been all morning. Midday he saw a spark. He kept his eyes on it. Sure enough, After a few minutes, he could see the rough outline of a car. Its windows reflected the sun. He waited. It drove closer. He didn't care if they were going the wrong way. At this point, he'd take a ride anywhere. He heard the hum of the engine. He stuck his arm out, raised his thumb. The car was upon him. He looked the driver straight in the face. He turned after them with a slim hope that vanished in the rush of the air. Frustrated, he turned back and saw what seemed to be a mirage. Idling off to the side of the road was a black town car. Where'd that come from? Pilon asked himself. He started towards it, but paused a moment, and then he sprinted. As he ran up, he could see two huge men in the front seat. The rear window rolled down. A little round man peered out with a friendly smile of shining gold. Ah, I see you found me, Pilon. Well done. Come now, hop in. Enough chatter. We've got many things to do and many things to see. Wonderful things. Many wonderful things. End of book one.